Right, so this is uh, redeploying the same vulnerabilities. This is a talk about EV security work that we've been doing for a little while together, and some of how we're seeing the same vulnerabilities that have existed for a long time coming back in, in modern standards. So this is Sebastian, and I'm Richard. We both work at Oxford University. We've been doing vehicle security stuff, among other stuff, uh, for about five years now, really focusing on EVs and charging security, the, the security when you plug it into charge. And that's all we're going to be talking about today, and then some thoughts about where that's, that field is going. Right, so we've probably all seen something like this, like a charging park, uh, as shown on this slide. Um, actually, back in December 2022, this was supposed to be, uh, be the largest charging park in Europe, uh, with, I believe, 56 charging outlets, DC fast charging outlets. Uh, but this keeps changing, so every week we hear about the new largest charging park. But EV charging is not just for cars. Uh, we can now see electric trucks, like this one here. Um, buses, so public transport, um, is currently um, electrified. Uh, this shows a bus depot in Hamburg. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, there are uh, wires actually hanging down from uh, the ceiling. And these are charging cables. So all these buses you can see here are fully electric. Another example is this, uh, sorry. Another example is this ferry. I'm going to switch to this. Yeah. Uh, this ferry, um, you can see it charges um, also with, uh, it's electric, and it has uh, 28 charging cables. So they charge simultaneously with 28 charging cables. Um, but there's also now a move in the mining industry, so making mining greener, so electrifying uh, mining equipment. Um, and yeah, why did I tell you all this? Well. All of these examples use actually the same charging standard, which is known as the Combined Charging System, or short CCS. So I don't know, most of the uh, people are probably familiar with the left one, which is uh, the Combined Charging System um, plug type 1, which is used in the US. And on the right is the one that is used in Europe. Uh, it's exactly the same technology, underlying technology. Uh, it's just a different plug type. So, of course, there are much more uh, charging standards, uh, as we can see on this overview here. But in this talk, we are going to focus on DC charging using the combined charging system. So why is CCS so interesting for us? Well, CCS is actually using a power line communication. So the car and the charger are communicating during a charging session all the time. So the car is telling the charger, hey, this is uh, how much electricity I need. Uh, this is the maximum current, the maximum voltage. Um, this is my state of charge. And the charger actually um, confirms these messages and also um, yeah, exchanges information about the charging session. There is more communication actually going on. Um, for example, with plug and charge, you can actually plug in your car and leave without tapping a card or using an app. It will automatically send your credentials to the charger, and the charging session will be authenticated. So yeah, it's quite a detailed uh, charging standard. There's a range of open standards that underpin it, and this is why it was quite interesting to us. It was also getting deployed very, very widely, even when we first started working on this. And that's a lot of infrastructure that's being built, going to be expensive, going to be hard to change. So keen to get in early. And even then, and ever since, we've been finding insecurities in a lot of charging infrastructure. And that made us concerned about the kind of things we were deploying. So particularly for CCS, we were interested in this power line communication, because it comes from a, a system called HomePlug, which was originally these little plug-in adapters you'd use at home for Wi-Fi extension. And there were some issues known about these in the past. And particularly, they were built for a different threat model. In-home, shared keys, not a kind of open public access network. Also, they were known decades ago, frankly, to be able to leak their signal radiatively out of cables. And this wasn't necessarily too much of a problem at home, but it's interesting when you see this deployed in a different setting. And of course, it's part of the deploying CCS and the new world of connected charging was that there are lots more services. There's not just talking car to charger, but also out to 
behind, uh, systems behind the scenes providing additional services, you know, automated billing, reactive charging, load balancing, all of these things that depend on having a nice secure link. And so it was kind of quite interesting to us. So we'll talk about a couple of bits of work here. We started with just a purely passive threat model. So what is it that someone just eavesdropping might want to do? Well, as ever, lift some fingerprints and have some privately identifiable information, of course. Um, and then also we thought maybe there'd be some opportunity for billing fraud here. So there is a system called AutoCharge, which a couple of networks implement, um, which just uses identifiers that are pretty much public. If someone could lift these, then they could use them to start to pretend to be people. And threat model's fairly simple. It's a kind of uh, motivated hobbyist. Not a lot of information, or not a lot of you know, deep technical knowledge to fully build systems from scratch, but someone that can run some code and has access to off-the-shelf hardware. Not much more than that. So for a particular attack, like a, one example, um, we had a look at signal level attenua attenuation characterization, slack. It's a slack attack. And this is a system that, in my opinion, probably shouldn't have existed in the first place. This is part of the initialization routine of a charging session, where the car and the charger need to make sure that, even though they're connected with a big cable, they're actually talking to the right charger. Because there's so much potential for crosstalk, conducted or radiative, that you could just be talking to the charger next door, like two, three meters away. That seems a little bit uh, a bad smell in, in designing the system. Also, there's a big long protocol here. I mean, you, you initiate the Slack session, you test the attenuation, and all the charges that can hear respond, and then you pick the one that has the lowest attenuation. So that's probably the one you're talking to. Uh, in step six and seven, you say, oh, OK, I've picked you. You're the charger for me. Can I join? And he goes, yeah, sure. The shared key is this. And that's just in the clear. Unless you've got this security mode turned on, which we've never seen happen, this is just given to the, the car. And so anyone that can lift that has a key for the network. There's some authentication later, but once you've got the master key, you're in. So can we do this in the world? Um, well, we set up an experiment. So we, ha we got a car. We went around some charging stations, and then we just set up software-defined radio. We've done this with diff different equipment setups over time, um, and just put the antenna at various points in the car, round nearby, a bit of an exploratory thing, to just see what kind of signal we could collect and whether we could use that for something. And we did quite a sort of long evaluation. Um, 800 miles of driving, there were three cars at the time. Um, we, every now and then, we, we pick up an electric car rental and we test it a bit further. Um, but even then, 14 locations, six networks, you know, enough to have a good overview of what was happening in the industry, all in the UK, where we're from. Um, but all, all kinds of places, you know, service stations, hotels, wherever we could find a CCS charger. And to put it into a bit of perspective, so these are places where we're placing the, the SDR and the antennas. You know, some of it was super, super close range. You're inside the car. We're interested in whether the signal is leaking out from the cable, whether it's leaking out from the car, you know, which part of the electronics. Some of it was further away. You'll notice it's even sunny in England sometimes, as this picture shows. Uh, here we've got uh, someone just behind the car in a, in a bay behind, you know, probably five meters away. and. You know, you're not going to suspect someone there for picking up your signal. And the other one on the right, we've, it's about four meters away, next bay. But this is you know, a reasonable dis short distance. And even some with two vehicles. So this is when we had the I-Pace and the Golf at the same time. Um, and we just went to, uh, you know, at this point, you know, one of the bigger charging parks we could get to. Of course, now that's changed and you have easily 50. But here, two was enough and just one radio shared between and multiple sessions being picked up. And so the, the end result was we picked up a signal basically every hour we went. You could, you could certainly see on, a, on like a, a frequency plot, so these, these plots in the top right, they're all spectrums. Um, you can see this distinctive frequency usage that you get with HomePlug. Do you notice these deep notches? They're in there to not interfere with amateur bands. 
Um, the fact that you've got this, this little visual fingerprint kind of already tells you that you're, you're picking up the signal. Um, the other thing to say is it you know, vastly varied between location, between site, between charger hardware, how much of this signal came through, and how much noise. You've got all of these noise spikes around. You've got a lot of you know, high-power el electrical um, devices working there to provide the charging, so you get a lot of noise when the charging starts. But point is, we could pick up the signal everywhere we went. And then we built uh, a receiver. So this is, this is open source. This is entirely software receiver. It takes a file in of just the raw signal, and then it processes it and pulls out the packets it can find. Um, and this is pretty much just doing what a normal modem would do, but it's open instead of in a, a proprietary IC. Um, so it, it detects the packets, it synchronizes on them, it does all the OFDM, and then at the end, spits out everything it possibly can. So messages, keys, uh, messages that fail to decode, but you might be able to get some data out of all of these, dumps them into a big database. Um, and it, as I say, it's available. If it's useful to community, please use it. Please build on it. So, I mean, this is a big table of numbers. You don't really need to read or parse it very much. The important things are probably left-hand column, lots and lots of messages, you know, thousands, big variation. Some sites very bad, some sites much better, but lots of messages. Uh, column on the right, these are messages that fully validated their CRCs, and so these are ones that are good. So the, these are both metrics of how, how well we were able to pick it up. So for two examples there, you know, next to the cable, beautiful clean signal, very easy, um, and it's nearly 100% of the messages that are valid. And they're all modulated slightly differently depending on which, which bit of the protocol they're in. So some of them are easier to pick up than others, but overall, you can pick up enough to have uh, a whole session. And a bit further away, of course, the performance falls down. We're still picking up some, you know, the bay next door or the bay behind. And I think with more equipment optimization, this was just stuff we had in the lab, you could you know, increase this number further. And then from that, we had, uh, we, we ran our bit of code. It took a long time to perfect. Um, but then out of individual messages, we just dumped out values. And so what we're seeing here are messages we received from the end of this Slack um, protocol. So in the, you can see in this sort of key column which messages is coming out of and which value we're, we're getting. And two are interesting here. One, for this privacy and fingerprints or identifiers issue, there's a vehicle Mac. We ended up getting the same cars multiple times over a period of months. These didn't change. I mean, the Mac addresses, you could rotate them fine, um, but they weren't being rotated. Some manufacturers and some batches of cars did not have vehicle unique identifiers. And we see this happening in auto charge, actually. Some vehicles are not compatible because some of the Macs are zeroed. The majority that we saw did have completely unique Macs. You can identify that car forever from that, and you can pick it up later sessions as normal. Um, then there's also, of course, the key. Um, this arrives a few seconds into starting a, a session. You pick it up. I mean, that's the key in plain text there. You also get it in Wireshark. And then from then on, the code automatically starts to decrypt the rest of the session once it's got that key. We're also outputting traffic to Wireshark. Um, it's a little bit of a messy capture here, but you can kind of see the process evolving. So at the top, you know, there's this request to get, get the master key. That's the that's stages six and seven I was talking about before getting it back, and then uh, trying to find the controller that's actually going to initiate the charge. Um, keen observers uh, on the blue lines, it talks support 15118. That's the ISO number of the standard. That was a kind of fun little Easter egg. Um, and then it sets up a tunnel, and then sets up higher communication, where it, there's a whole stack of things. It's IP communication. Um, then there's TCP on top, then maybe there's crypto on top of that, and then there's just sending XML back and forth for state of charge, for charging speed, temperature, and all these other things. Um, that's also up where you would have like automated billing and stuff. Um, per the standard, all of those would require you to have a TLS session. So I'm not saying that there is traffic 
before that that we've ever seen unencrypted or accessible from here. You're only getting the lower layers. Um, there's also a lot of support, though, for external additional services to be built on. This is ultimately an IP link, right, with two Linux boxes either end. You could put any services you want. You can open additional ports. You could have a web interface and so on. And there's some talk about that, although we haven't seen it much in the wild being deployed. But any of that, you're then back into whether the developer secures that as well as they should. For the simplest standard, DIN 70121, this is just charging. There's no security on top of that. But there's also only so much you can learn. You can get the identifier out. You can listen to traffic. But there's not too much important stuff going over it. There has been latterly some talk about different approaches to try and secure this. Some people, one particularly big manufacturer, is talking about just establishing a VPN on top, which maybe goes back to your own charging provider. I mean, that or TLS is providing you some crypto either way. I think the big problem is doing the PKI to support this and having the right keys for everyone, for the charger, for the car, for the driver, for everyone involved. Still ongoing. Right, so as Richard just told us, uh, he basically found that there is um, an, a unique, high quality, unintentional wireless channel when you use PLC charging or when you use CCS and uh, that uses PC, uh, PLC. So the main question we asked us ourselves was, can we actually also inject? Because the charging cable is a perfect antenna, right? We, we can receive, it emits the signal. So can we also inject into the, the antenna? So we looked at what can someone do, like a threat model about active attacks. So how can you actually uh, interact with this communication and what can you do? So since CCS or in general electric vehicles are becoming part of critical infrastructure, so they will be acting as battery buffers for um, renewable energies. Uh, we will have vehicle to grid communication and feed electricity back into the grid. Um, it's kind of important that they are available. So we, we need this communication. Otherwise, we will not be able to use these services. So we, we looked at, can we disrupt an individual vehicle? So this actually is probably the weakest um, motivation. But we just had it yesterday, actually, when we uh, drove here from LA. Uh, we wanted to charge our car. And all of the chargers were um, occupied. So could you interrupt, actually, one of the chargers? and? get the cable, I mean, no one would notice, right? So most of the cars, I um, don't know if you're aware of that, but most of the cars actually uh, unlock the charging cable if the charging has stopped or is interrupted. Um, we assume it's a safety feature. Uh, but yeah, most of the cars we tested, actually all of the cars, I believe, implemented this feature. So yeah, you could just disrupt an, a single vehicle, get the charging cable, charge yours, and be happy. Um, but of course, there could be another motivation, a fi financial motivation, for example. Um, back in Oxford in the UK, um, DPD has fully electric fleet now. I believe 40 to 50 vehicles fully electric. So if you can just knock out their entire fleet, so they can't charge, let's say, during the night, you could just blackmail them. Uh, they will turn up in the morning and the cars are not charged. Um, Another motivation could be uns uh, unspecific disruption. So you try to disrupt as many cars as possible or as many charging parks as possible to, for example, disrupt supply chain. Uh, we, we saw earlier buses um, are getting electrified, um, ferries and trucks. So if you just cause widespread disruption, that's going to be an issue, especially if we then uh, go a few years further and look at vehicle to grid communication and bidirectional charging. Uh, oh, yeah, I should mention maybe for um, this threat model or for these goals, we assume exactly the same capabilities. So just access to software-defined radio or a transmitter off the shelf you can get from uh, Amazon um, and a little bit of knowledge about digital signal processing. So we found broken wire. And broken wire exploits the CSMA CA uh, mechanism used by Homeplug GreenFi. So how did we actually find this? Well, again, we, we had this. There is an... Uh, unintentional wireless channel, can we inject? And then we looked at the standard, actually, and we found this interesting phrase. And this phrase basically says that the modem should consider someone else communicating if they receive a preamble with 2 dB above noise. Um, what this means is basically um, the, the receiver or the transmitter would actually uh, stop transmitting when someone else is already transmitting to uh, 
make sure there is no interference happening. Uh, for some of you who may, might not be familiar with CSMA CA, here's just a diagram how this usually works. So let's assume you have a car and a charger, and they don't have or wouldn't have CSMA CA. Uh, the car would send a message, charger replies, all are happy, but if they same, uh, send at the same time, you would have interference. So instead, actually, uh, the home plug green fire modem um, checks if the channel is clear to send. And if it is clear to send, it, it would send a message, and so on. And if it is actually not clear to send, and you can see it here, it waits for a random period of time. So it backs off and then tries again and checks, is the channel now clear? And if it is, it, it sends the message. So on the previous slide, I just showed you the standard says someone is communicating or the channel is busy if we see a preamble 2 dB above noise. And so what someone could do, actually, if we now have an attacker, someone could just, uh, during a communication, which is happening um, just fine, start sending a signal to make the channel look busy. So in our case, actually, that is the preamble. So here you can see a home plug green phi frame. Um, we collected by just plugging a modem into a software defined radio. Um, so this is in the time domain. And the first bit you can see is the preamble. So that is used to detect if someone is communicating and also do um, frequency offset uh, correction and timing. And then you have the frame control and yeah, the uh, legacy frame control and the AV frame control. And then you have the payload. And as I said, this was uh, collected while plugging the modem actually into our receiver. And there is also some noise, of course. And you might have already spotted it, but there is also another preamble in there. And uh, this is a preamble which is 2 dB above noise. And this preamble actually already caused the modems to back off because they consider this as, oh, someone is communicating. I need to stop. I need to wait until this uh, communication has ended. So when we found this um, vulnerability, we initially tested it in our lab. We got these development boards. Um, the, these boards have exactly the same Qualcomm chip as you can find it in charging stations. Uh, it's a QCA7000. And yeah, as I said, it's exactly the same chip. Uh, we connected one to a Raspberry Pi, and this was our electric vehicle, and then the other one, which was our charging station. So the Raspberry Pi was actually just um, providing uh, some traffic so we can measure um, packet loss and um, the quality, or like examine the quality of the channel, basically. Yeah, we connected them with a charging cable, um, and then we had an attacker, which you can see in the lower part. Uh, we used uh, just a super simple antenna. It's a very low frequency. So PLC is communicating at around um, 2 to 28 megahertz, like in this band. Um, so we set a center frequency to uh, 17 megahertz. So we have a pretty uh, high or large uh, wavelengths. So our antenna was actually uh, just a bunch of wires. And I have a photo later where you can see it. Uh, we connected this to a small amplifier and the Lime SDR. So this setup costs you maybe I mean, now the Lime SCR actually got quite expensive, but uh, it was maybe $250, $300 um, before the chip prices, yeah. Um, right, so we did some experiments in our um, lab, like in the university. You can see the home plug green fire modems in the back. Um, our attacker set up in the front, and this was roughly, I don't know, maybe eight, nine meters, and we successfully disrupted it. So we... Um, plotted some graphs. We basically tested for a given um, distance how much power do we need to disrupt this charging communication. I mean, just a home plug uh, green fire communication. And as you can see, um, so it's, it's plotted in dBm and, and milliwatts. Um, on the left, dB, uh, dBm, you can see that for a distance of 10 meters, we actually were able to disrupt this uh, communication with less than uh, 10 dBm or 10 milliwatts. Uh, so your Wi-Fi router is probably transmitting at around 100 milliwatts. So just to give you an idea, this is like very, very low uh, output power. And this was from 10 meters away. So we also wanted to test, can we actually disrupt be um, between floors, just for the sake of it? And yeah, we were able to do it. Uh, so you can see on the first floor, uh, we put the modems there. We didn't even stretch out the charging cable. So it was like a, a bunch of wires or just like a pile of wires. And then we were the floor below. And we had um, the antenna lined up and just transmitted. I can't remember exactly how much power we had for this experiment, but it was on the order of like 70 to 100 milliwatts. 
So of course we were curious. Actually, I mean, we only tested this so far in the lab. Can we actually target charging stations out in the wild? Can we test this on real cars? So we got all of our equipment into the boot of a car. Uh, here, actually, you can see the in our antenna, which is just a bunch of wires I mentioned. Um, amplifier, Lime SDR, bench power supply, which we uh, powered with uh, a UPS. Um, but we, we changed the setup. So now we actually just use a power bank um, with a step-up converter be because we need 12 volts for the amplifier. Uh, so you can easily fit this in your backpack, for example. And yeah, we tested uh, different scenarios. Um, so for example, can I just attach the antenna uh, to the side of the car or just in the boot and then drive or pass by uh, a charger? Um, can we do a scenario where I'm behind some like bushes, bushes and then like, disrupt the charging? This is, so I would say scenario two, three, and four are commonly seen at supermarkets, for example. And then we did another one which was just focusing on distance. So we wanted to see how far can we actually go given our power budget of one watt, which was limited by government regulations, so we couldn't transmit higher than one watt. Um, I also want to say we, we don't re uh, reveal which cars we tested and which chargers, just because we want to stress it's a standards issue. It's not an individual car manufacturer who implemented it wrong. They follow the standard, and the standard, like Home Black Green Fi, is just vulnerable. Um, so these were the cars we tested. This overview just shows you um, it's not just cheap cars. Uh, it goes up to $150,000 cars. Um, so it was actually quite sad. We had to drive all these cars for quite a while and then uh, run down the batteries, charge them again, run down the battery. Um, so it was, a, was quite fun uh, driving the shooting brake. Um, but yeah. And so yeah, yeah, as you can see, all of them are vulnerable. It also doesn't matter what the ch uh, charging capacity is. Uh, so, of course, if you charge with a higher capacity, you might have more noise, but didn't really matter. It still worked. So we did the distance experiment. Uh, again, one watt uh, of amplification. Um, so roughly one watt. It was just below. Um, and we were able to disrupt it from a, around 50 meters. So what can we do to prevent this? So to prevent leaking the signal or actually having the antenna or the charging cable acting as an antenna, of course, shielding would be the way to go. But actually, shielding doesn't work here very well because the cable is already quite stiff and heavy. Adding shielding um, might reduce um, the vulnerability or susceptibility to EMI. But actually, in the end, you just increase the power. And since we're talking about super low um, transmission power here, uh, you can buy a 10 watt, 70 watt, or 600 watt amplifier in this band, and um, you would still be good. And then, yeah, you would need to add more shielding. So it's an arms race. Uh, another idea would be upgrade the firmware of the Qualcomm chip. And if anyone from Qualcomm is here by any chance, I mean, we would be happy to chat about this because um, it would be quite interesting to know if actually um, the preamble detection and the 2dB if this is a threshold which is set in firmware, uh, or if it's a, it's a hardware limitation. And then finally, one thing we noticed, once you disrupt the charging session, it stays disrupted. So you would need to walk there, unplug the cable, plug it in again, tap your card or um, activate via the app. Or if you have plug and charge, I guess it would do it automatically. But you would need to re-authenticate, which is a pain because um, if you, if you have a depot um, like the DPD um, fleet I mentioned earlier, uh, you'd need to go there, disrupt it. It takes 20 seconds, and then you leave, and it will be disrupted for the whole night. It automatically doesn't re-authenticate or re-continue the charging session. So we, we said redeploying the same vulnerabilities. So why was this the title of our talk? Well, w what is next? That's the big question. And currently, there is work going on on the megawatt charging system, MCS. And interestingly, um, so it has uh, almost uh, 4 megawatt of charging capacity. Um, but interestingly, it also uses power line communication again. It uses differential PLC, which should be um, yeah, not as easy to disrupt. But we haven't tested it yet, because it's not widely de or it's not deployed yet. Um, just um, for your information, this is like the plug. Um, compared to CCS, I mean, it looks quite similar. Uh, but you now have a communication interface in the middle uh, for a twisted pair. Um, yeah, so 
the differential signaling should significantly improve um, like the, the EMC compatibility of the PLC communication. But yeah, as I said, we haven't uh, tested this yet. And using a shielded, unshielded twisted pair, UDP wire should also help to increase noise immunity. Um, roughly 40 dB higher um, is Jarin saying on their website. So Jarin is the uh, standardization body um, of CCS and MCS. Um, but I would like to, to highlight here that even if you shield the cable, you use differential um, PLC and you use twisted pair, the signal could just couple into some other bits, right? Like onto the PCB directly. So uh, you could um, modulate your signal into a higher carrier, high frequency carrier. And so it's not, if you just make the uh, wire um, not attackable, it, it doesn't mean the system is not attackable. And now there is also um, the North American charging standard. Um, I guess you all know it. It's uh, the Tesla plug. And they say basically that uh, for DC charging, the electric vehicle should, or NC NACS, should support power line communication to make it compatible with uh, DIN 7121. And it should also support ISO 15118, which means if it needs to support ISO 15118, it needs to support PLC communication. So what is the conclusion? Well, CCS is vulnerable to wireless attacks. We showed that we can eavesdrop on it, but we can also inject. Roughly 20 million vehicles are currently vulnerable because CCS is mainly used, or is the DC charging standard in Europe. Um, it's also widely used in the US uh, and in some parts of Asia. And we just think PLC is just not a good technology to use in such a critical communication. So I just have a video uh, for you. Um, just ignore the Renault Sorry on the left. Um, as I said, I didn't want to reveal which car we tested on, but yeah. So the car was charging, as you could see. And we put the equipment, um, as you saw in one of the photos, uh, in the back of the car. And then as soon as we pass by, you will see that the charging stopped. Yeah, and this is the error where uh, you need to go unplug it, plug it in again, so it doesn't um, go away automatically. Right, um, that's it. If you have any questions, feel free um, to reach out to us um, on brokenwire.fail. Um, we have more information. There is also the paper available, and there is also some information um, on NIST uh, yeah, for the CVE we got. Um, but yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there is a microphone right here if you have any questions. Hi. Hey. Uh, just a question. Were, were you able to also, there was a, you mentioned about the billing. You can, there is a communication between vehicle and uh, the charging station and there is a billing associated with it. Were you also able to get into the billing, like uh, able to manipulate the user to charge? Um, sorry, if I understood you correctly, you're, yeah. talk, uh, or you're asking about the identifier which yeah. is transmitted between the car yeah. and the charger. So there are different uh, implementations, I would say. Yeah. Uh, there is one which is called auto charge, which is basically the MAC address of your uh, EV charging co uh, controller, mm -hmm. and so, um, if you have the MAC address, um, yeah, you can. So if I um, eavesdrop on your communication and get your MAC address uh, and spoof my MAC address, yeah. I could charge and you would be paying for it. Okay. So basically, we can uh, sniff a MAC address from the car between a charger during its session, and then we can use this to auto uh, bill for the, that user that we sniff. Is, is that correct? Sorry, could you speak up a bit? I, it's hard yeah. to hear. So uh, the, the, uh, the car c connects to the charging station. During the initial session, we sniff the MAC address. And then can we replay that to charge the user? Uh, right, if we can replay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, do you want to? Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. you capture that MAC address. Yeah. You set your MAC address. Yeah. That's associated with someone's billing account. 
okay. then you just go and charge until they cancel it because they realize they're being charged. Oh, okay. It doesn't, it's not the same for plug and charge, and this is the sort of gold standard thing. Okay. Auto charge was just um, a couple of uh, industry players wanting to kind of get in on this kind of frictionless experience mm-hmm. early. Plug and charge, no. There's certificates both sides. There's, as far as we know, good crypto. Um, mm-hmm. It's not very widely deployed yet. Okay. But yeah, that's yeah. safe. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Dumb question. Uh, will the slide deck be available on the GitHub uh, site? The, the This slide deck? That slide deck. Uh, it could be, yes. Um, it's not currently, but it could be. There's certainly slides from other talks we've done on it. This one has a little bit of extra content. But yeah, that paper, code, you can get. Yeah. Some appropriate slide deck. I, I know some folks where the slide deck would be great for explaining. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, the, I think you'll find all you the resources there. No worries. One question, please. The MAC address that you identified, this is a MAC address of the vehicle or of the charging system of the vehicle? Uh, there are two, and you get both of them in different messages. Um, are you, so you sure get it's the, the same one? So there's a modem one, and then there's one for the, um, uh, what is it, the, the charge controller. Um, and we've observed different behavior in different vehicles. Some of them have one, one, byte diff- um, one bit different. Some have the same MAC address in both. Some have... Uh, one of them blanks and one of them not. Uh, it depends on which one you, you're Because it's at. totally different DCUs. The Mac address usually will be in part of the TCU mm-hmm. and not part of the charging system. I'm oh, sorry, I missed that bit. The, the Mac the address... The Mac address will come from the TCU. From the, from the con- uh, controller on the, the EVCC? Yes, not yeah. from the uh, charging system. But we, we, we have one from the modem and one from, um, from that, from the EVCC. Okay. Um, so I, I, I mean, I could show you in some captures, and it does, as I say, vary between. But yeah, they establish a communication between the two high-level entities. Um, and then the, the in very early initialization messages are modem to modem. So we, we have ones for those as well. OK, thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, you were talking about NACS and similar vulnerabilities. Seeing as Nax is coming up, well, Sharon is trying to standardize it now. Is this an opportunity to kind of address some of the vulnerabilities with some of your suggestions? Um, yes, would be our opinion. Um, there's, I mean, so, some things are very difficult to change, right? You've got a, a standard that has um, this communication which is possibly not the best choice baked into it. Um, that's probably going to be difficult to do. Some changes are coming that are really good, like MCS having this differential PLC, or um, changes that you could deploy later, like um, firmware differences or additional sort of um, detection systems for just constant preamble or something. But yeah, I mean, as a, a general rule, yes, let's try to fix this, and, and hence why we're sort of doing this talk now. Um, and we'd be happy to engage with anyone that's doing work on any new charging standard. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, if you need to, if you want me to. Yeah, so um, the question I have is like, uh, the, the SDR you guys use to do this attack is, um, is kind of unique. Because uh, to do this, you need something that has at least 28 megahertz of, uh, of RF bandwidth. I'm oh, sorry, more. I'm having difficulty hearing uh, you. Uh, all right. Probably just close to the mic is fine. But. Okay. Um, so the SDR you guys use to do this is somewhat unique in the fact that because you need like uh, about 28 megahertz of, ban- of uh, mm-hmm. RF bandwidth in order to, d- to, a, to, a t- to do this attack. But so like things like a hack RF won't work because they've only got 20 megahertz. Mm-hmm. Now the, the new Lime SDRs don't have this nice wide band that the original one did. And hence, that's why the price of the Z's have gone up. But I'm kind of curious, if, have you guys found anything other than like a high-end USRP mm. that will do this? You know, has it required RF bandwidth? Because I, I, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, so we played with a, a couple of different ones. I mean, I think prices went up a little bit across the board. Well, you know, at okay. the time, the big line SDR was, what, a couple of hundred dollars. Um, and that was really good. That was why we had it. And it also worked natively in that band. Um, the previous work, the, the, the eavesdropping, uh, I was using a Blade RF, which was reasonably inexpensive at the time, but it didn't tune to that band, so we had an up converter to bring it up to there. Um, and basically, we've had pretty good success with those. I will, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to be the best buy at the moment, um, but my gut feeling is probably still a Lime SDR. They've got more expensive, 
but they're still not you know quite USLP territory. Um, oh, the, so the current line, or are you talking about the old version and trying to get it off eBay? Uh, frankly, either. I mean, I would probably uh, a, a V2 would should work fine. We haven't tested the V2 ourselves, but um, you know, it, it, well, the V2 does it. have the required bandwidth. Yes. Um, and it'll tune down to you know tune yes. down to two, two to twenty two yeah. to thirty um, megahertz. And in fact, I mean, depending on what attack you want to do, whether you're you know, you, you could just do up conversion, down conversion, use something else. That might be quite a good route. Um, I mean, if, if you wanted a recommendation of what to buy, we could perhaps have a little off, offline chat, but most of the things that are above, you know, an RTL or something should work fine. I will also say you might have some success even with the 20 megahertz from a hack RF for two reasons. One, we did test broken wire with less of the preamble, you know, because some of this will get attenuated anyway. And I can't remember how low we went, but you could you could cut off a surprising amount and still have the preambles register as accurate. Oh, the preambles don't use all the uh, OFDM they, channels? They, they do, but even if some of it is horribly attenuated, there's enough signal for it to correlate well and trigger as a preamble. Oh, um, sweet. In theory, you should be able to even do some eavesdropping because GreenFi replicates all across the band. So there's five copies or sometimes seven copies, depending on which message you're talking about, um, for exactly the same problem. You know, it's a very, very hostile network if you're if you're um, hostile uh, transmission environment on, on these wires. And so it's built to be robust against that. And you could lose a whole chunk of the subcarriers and still recover messages. Oh. Of course, your mileage may vary, but uh, you might have some success with the HackRF if not. Yeah, probably swap in for a Lime SDR or the, or the Blade RF and up converter. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. I didn't know that about I thought I was using all the off -games. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it tries to, but it's surprisingly resistant to, to loss or noise or whatever. Okay. Happy to talk more afterwards. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Hi. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really knowledgeable about the protocol, but... Uh, has Qualcomm uh, implemented something like a spread spectrum or something that can mitigate the radiations? I mean, whenever we do EMC testing, we basically look for uh, if we have this type of radiations, we reduce the speed, reduce the slew rates, or uh, also doing some spread spectrum on the transceivers to mitigate the radiations. Has this been uh, already placed on the table? Um, so, no, so it's, a, it's an OFDM system, um, and there's certainly per carrier control to, to stay under EMC limits. Um, so part of it was, of course, that, that distinctive spectrum template that I showed, you know, do, uh, notching out the, um, the amateur bands. Um, and you could power control there or, you, and, um, or notch more of them out if you needed to. Um, and for EMC purposes, fine. It is just under the, the threshold for, for radiation, um, I think. Realistically, it's just a, if you turn up your LNA enough, you can kind of still pick it up, but, it, but it's still compliant. Okay, um, so. And then there's plenty on in, above that in terms of varying modulation to try to get the best rates and so on, but that's less of a compliance thing and more of a, a throughput issue. Okay, um, so, yeah, so only through uh, differential wires, canceling the, the fields, and that will be enough for, for the uh, mitigation, right? Yeah, on the I mean, so. Version? Some implementations of this are a wire, um, um, right. at which point it's just going to be leaking out all over the place. Um, the differential down a twisted pair, yeah, that's probably going to be very helpful. Um, but you know, bear in mind this is a technology that's coming from an in-home environment and genuinely people's power wiring, which is just you know, a, a wires randomly laid over 50 years by different electricians and so on. So right. it's not, it wasn't really built as a communication protocol for a purpose-built environment, but rather making the best use it, it could of, of the conditions it had. And that's why it's not ideal here. And yeah. is the amount of information uh, that you do during the handshake uh, really needs the amount of uh, speed? Or, um, or why not use lean or... or, or yeah, I, I mean, all the other charging standards do not... They, I typically use a CAN bus link and mm. do fine. Right. Um, I think a lot of it was a future-proofing idea, um, and, and there were some really nice design choices. Have an IP link, you can just do whatever. You can deploy the same technologies we have, there's no reinventing the wheel. Personally, I'm not sure PLC was the best underpinning for that, you know, but, um, but no, I, it's, it's hard to make a case. It's, it was more to just create the capability to deploy whatever we might need in the future, rather than because you need that much data. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>